Good morning uh, from Washington, D.C., and welcome to week two of our virtual academic program, Developing Local Strategies to Counter Violent Extremism in, in Africa. I am, uh, as I introduced myself last week, Anwar Bukhars, Professor of Counterterrorism and Counter Violent Extremism here at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies. I am the lead faculty uh, of this program. Today's plenary session, <coughs> designing and drafting a local uh, CV action plan will be moderated by, um, by my uh, friend and colleague, uh, Idris Lalali, the acting director of the African Union Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism, uh, CHIRT. So with, with that, I'll, I'll, I'll pass it, uh, you know, to, uh, again, to, to, to my friend, the uh, distinguished uh, uh, colleague, uh, Idris. Thank you. Thank you indeed, Anwar. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, wherever you may be. Uh, again, my name is Idris Munir Lalali. I'm the acting director of the African Center for the Study and Research on Terrorism. And uh, as uh, introduced by Anwar, I'll be the moderator of uh, today's session two on designing and drafting local CVE action plan of the joint ACSS, ACSRT training program on developing local strategies to counter violent extremism in Africa. Indeed, today's session is a continuation of the first week plenary and group discussions on understanding the, national, uh, the rationale for local CVE action plans. If you remember whose object, objectives were among others uh, to provide the general overview of the importance of local CVE action plans and the necessity of aligning national strategies with local context and casual or sorry, core causal factors associated with violent extremism. The session also illustrated how local CVE action plans can help bridge the divide between national level policymaking and the frontline community practitioners. And finally, uh, last week's session explained how local action plans enable greater local ownership and ensure the building of a bottom-up approach to uh, community resilience. It therefore uh, becomes clear, I think after last week's discussions and, um, and presentations, that localized approaches to countering violent extremism are indeed the backbone of state efforts to tackle the underlying drivers of this phenomenon. Yet, a knowledge on how national CVE strategies are translated into actions at the local levels still remains limited. But to date, we have little insight into how cooperative and coordinated efforts between and among the different stakeholders and actors are established and integrated into national and local CV action plans. There are still distinctive gaps into how relevant government agencies and non-government actors are integrated into the stages of conceptualizing, developing, implementing, and monitoring CVE activities and programs. Gaps also remain in understanding how local action plans to CVE are planned, designed, and implemented. There are not many countries, as we heard from last week's discussion, around the world, particularly in the global south, that have developed subnational plans. And also, there is not a one size or a one size fits all template for the development of such plans. Uh, dear colleagues, <clears throat> As uh, this uh, session will uh, today will help us tackle many of the questions that were raised during last week. And we're very privileged to have two uh, capable, very capable, I must say, uh, experts in the field with considerable uh, experience joining us uh, this week. Uh, I would like you to uh, welcome uh, Mr. Eric Rosant. He is the director of the uh, prevention program or project, so, sorry, organizing against violent extremism in Washington, DC. A senior associate fellow at the Royal United Service Institute in London and president and founder of PVE Solutions. He is interim director of the Strong Cities Network. He is also co-lead of securing the future initiatives to assess uh, sorry, uh, of securing the future initiative to assess the Security Council's counterterrorism efforts since 9-11. And our second speaker today is Mr. Dominic Kalia, a senior regional manager at Institute for Strategic Dialogue, ISD, working across ISD's counter 
extremism initiatives in Kenya and the wider East Africa region. Dominic also supports the policy development, research, education, and monitoring and evaluation methods to measure the impact of counter extremism programs off and off and online. Dominic was previously the chief of party for strengthening community resilience against extremists. A USAID funded counterterrorism project implemented in the coastal region of Kenya. So let me start with you, Eric. Let me welcome you uh, both, uh, both Eric and Dominic. Uh, but let me start with Eric. Um, Eric, please, based on your experience with the prevention pro project organizing against violent extremism, can you share with the participants some CVE local plans and why do they matter? Uh, please, as you know, we agreed, let's try to, as much as possible, you know, provide some, some examples. So over to you, Eric. Welcome. Thank you very much. Um... Idris, and thank you to Anwar and uh, the Africa Center for uh, including me, but more importantly, uh, for bringing this topic, uh, elevating the, the importance of this topic. And um, I think uh, one has to take a step back and just remind us ourselves why um, uh, local action plans are so critical when we're talking about CVE, because it's really, it's the confluence of a whole of society approach and a local approach meeting uh, in these local action plans. Um, the question is, is, is a somewhat challenging one to answer, the one that you posed, uh, Idris, because in fact, there are very few um, local action plans and that's uh, for a number of reasons. Um, I think the primary reason is that despite everyone's recognition of the importance of um, uh, a local action plan that is a co essentially a coordinated set of local activities led by a city typically or a municipality. There are very few cities and municipalities that are either feel empowered to lead locally on, on preventing and countering violent extremism uh, um, or have the resources and capacities to do that or have a strong enough relationship with the national government um, uh, to be again uh, mandated to do that very few national action plans actually mention the role of municipalities in them uh, or cities, which would then translate into the development of local action plans. Uh, one of the few examples I can think of where there, where, where um, municipalities are mentioned is in Lebanon, in the uh, uh, PCVE strategy in Lebanon, which has then, uh, open the space for municipalities to um, not so much develop local action plans, but to develop local prevention networks, which is often in a, in a, in a perfect world would be uh, an output from a local action plan. Um, a local prevention network is essentially uh, bringing together around um, the, a, a common space all the different relevant stakeholders at a local level who are involved in prevention work, whether it's teachers, social workers, um, uh, health professionals, religious leaders, youth workers, coaches, um, uh, around the table to talk about uh, raising awareness about extremism and radicalization in the community and what types of interventions um, are going to be most helpful to prevent um, the rise of, of, of those threats. Um, a couple of challenges that we've seen in Lebanon uh, relate to the relationship with the community and non-security actors and um, the, the police or the intelligence service. And what you end up having is a is a somewhat bifurcated, sort of segregated approach to PCVE, which is preventions on the one side involving the non security actors and the countering of violent extremism is on the other side involving the law enforcement and intelligence and security services. That's in many respects because of the trust issues that are, are the trust deficits between these two poles. Um, and uh, I would argue that's not the most um, sustainable or effective approach and that um, you can move forward with a network, you can move forward with an action plan, but if you don't have uh, at, at, at the root of it, trust between and among, uh, not only within the community, between the, the various, whether it's social workers, health professionals, 
um, CSOs among them, but also between them and the police. Um, and that's where some of the challenges come in that inhibit um, the actual sitting at a table to develop local action plans. That being said, as Dominique will talk about uh, when he speaks, uh, Kang is a, a wonderful example where, where this has been, despite some challenges on the trust issues, they've been able to move forward um, with the development of, of local action plans. But I won't, I won't steal uh, Dominique's thunder, but I will say that there are some, a few other examples uh, around the world that are, are worth noting, um, but none of them happened organically. Uh, in the, I'm talking now in, the, in sort of the, 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 developed, the more developing con world context. None of them happened organically. They typically have been driven in part by um, international actors, whether it's the UN, the World Bank, or uh, the US, the UK, the Dutch. Um, but the, the Western Balkans is a great example where we've seen in uh, North Macedonia in, in the city of Kumanova, which is the second biggest, I believe, city in, in, um, in uh, the country, they have developed a local action plan that's very much focused on building the capacities of the various local stakeholders from the teachers, from the social workers, again, from the uh, religious leaders uh, and even family members. The idea is that in order for local communities to be engaged in this space, many of them need training. They need awareness raising. In some cases, they need very specialized training if you're a social worker or a mental health professional because you're not used to working um, with this type of cohort, individuals who are seen to be uh, potentially at risk of uh, radicalization to violence uh, driven by ideology or other, other political beliefs or, or what have you. Um, and, and Kumanova started with a team, actually. They started with identifying a team uh, at a local level that would be the core um, actors uh, at a community level on these issues. Um, and they then went to develop a local action plan, which is very basic. And again, it's focused heavily on uh, prevention um, issues. The interesting thing that happened there is that um, although the national government was encouraging and was uh, creating a space for this uh, and its national strategy actually, um, I believe a revised version actually um, uh, explicitly mentioned these, these types of programs. Um, the Ministry of Interior couldn't help itself. And when it came time for the community action team to both develop the action plan and then start operationalizing it, um, the, there was a, the, the evaluation of, the, of this program revealed that the Ministry of Interior was too involved and um, was too directive. And the perception in the community was that this was not a locally owned, locally driven um, platform and a plan, but it was actually um, being heavily influenced by the Ministry of Interior. Uh, and so I think all of this gets to the critical importance of getting the national local relationship, national local cooperation uh, dynamics right before you start embarking on a local action plan. There has to be um, a clear understanding on both the city level and the national level why a, a city-led local action plan is so important, not only for the city, but for the national, for the central government. Um, and that's for many of the reasons that Idris outlined in the beginning. Um, but I think too often uh, people are impatient, particularly donors are impatient, and um, uh, steps are skipped because people just want the action plan as the output of the project. But in fact, that output just send a piece of paper. And that if you actually are really talking about uh, sustainable uh, action at a local level that goes beyond an individual project, um, uh, you really need to invest in the front end on the trust building, on the awareness raising, on the understanding of everyone's roles and responsibilities, not just within a community, and not just at the central government level, but between both. And I think um, uh, there's some work starting on that. The Global Counterterrorism Forum uh, adopted a set of uh, good practices uh, about a year ago that highlights some of the, the good practices for strengthening national local cooperation, uh, highlights some of the uh, good practices for developing local action plans. And uh, we can get into that um, in, in later on in the session, but I, I will uh, just close by saying that um, there's a 
clear recognition of the value of local action against violent extremism. We've seen literally thousands of locally led initiatives spring up in the last few years in Africa and elsewhere focused on either directly or indirectly on preventing and countering violent extremism. What local action plans do in a perfect sense is connect the dots on all of that in a community. So you don't have a series of pinpricks, as I like to say, but a series of interconnected and mutually reinforcing initiatives that are um, in the end greater than the sum of the parts. Um, and so I think that should be the, the goal is to try to, before one sits down and actually tries to develop a local action plan to really understand what are the key ingredients that need to be in there um, to ensure success um, so that the plan at the end of the day is not just a piece of paper because anyone can draft a plan. It's what, what, what the elements of the plan have to include, again, the trust, the understanding, the shared vision that only comes with a certain amount of time and investment on the front end. So I'll leave it at there um, and I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thank you, Eric. Very, very important uh, points and uh, uh, they're in uh, total, um, I would say, complementary of the discussions we had last week in relation to developing some of these plans as compliance or as a condition to receive funding from partners, but not, not, not out of necessity. Uh, and that's why, um, you, know, um, uh, you know, many of the countries uh, are having difficulties not only in, uh, in, in aligning their national strategies against the threat they're facing, but also making sure that the action plans are indeed driven from the bottom uh, and responding to particular uh, factors and conditions. Um, and also that are, uh, you know, action plans that are uh, that serve the purpose. Um, okay, uh, Dominique, let me revert to you now. Uh, given your worth of experience, and then uh, Eric has, has said so much a great deal about what we expect from your intervention. Um, uh, given your worth of experience in strengthening community resilience against extremism, uh, how do you establish the need uh, and demand for a CVE local action plan? in a policy environment uh, dominated by nationally centered CVE strategies uh, design. Uh, again, you know, if you can provide us with some concrete example. And I thank you, Rick, for, you know, Lebanon and Macedonia as good examples. I was taking notes and I hope the participant did, uh, they are also taking notes. So go ahead, uh, Dominique, merci. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Idris. And uh, I am honored uh, to be speaking in this webinar. Uh, good morning, good evening, uh, depending on wherever you are. And I'm happy that uh, Eric has already set a context uh, for this discussion. And actually you are right that uh, these discussions uh, builds uh, from the first discussion we had uh, in the first week. And uh, before probably I talk about uh, why uh, the need for a local action plan, I think uh, first again, and again, giving the Kenyan experience, uh, we need to find out uh, if whatever you are trying to address is a national issue. And uh, for Kenya, radicalization, extremism, or terrorism, uh, whichever way you use it, is actually a national peace and security issue. Uh, if you look at some of the global terrorism index uh, reports or indexes, uh, actually in 2014, uh, Kenya was ranked number 12 in the world in terms of uh, terrorism, and actually that in Africa after Nigeria and Somalia. And that uh, was enough to, 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 to uh, demonstrate that, yes, this is a national uh, security issue that we need uh, to find a way of working on it. Uh, so from the national level, it, uh, it, it is a concern, it's a priority. But now when we come to the local level, why do we need this local national plan? And uh, for the Kenyan experience, we are calling it a county action plan uh, because in Kenya, we have two levels of government, uh, the national government, and the county government. And I think in, in some other African countries, uh, maybe that's what you call the regions or federal states or uh, something like that. So, and I think uh, at least you are right that uh, peace and security, not only in Kenya, but uh, in the whole of Africa, uh, is basically a national uh, government issue. Uh, all policy and legal frameworks are uh, touching on peace and security, including extremism, uh, is basically a business of the national government. And uh, if you come back to the Kenyan uh, experience, uh, in 2010, uh, we had a new constitution in Kenya and these constitutions established the second type of government, now the county government. So from that point, and actually starting in 2013, so it became apparent to us that yes, we have two levels of government. But uh, from the very beginning, still security was a mandate of the national government 
and not of the county government. And that's why uh, this debate was really dominated by the uh, policy uh, environment uh, regarding uh, what the national government is doing uh, to address uh, this problem. But as we now try to start to look at this uh, environment, especially looking at our national strategy to counter violent extremism that was launched in 2016, uh, we realized as a county that yes, uh, there are actually gaps and deficiencies within the existing policy frameworks. For example, I talked about the national strategy uh, in addressing uh, some of these issues. Our strategy has a very uh, good, uh, uh, like, uh, uh, pillars or our priority areas, what we need to address as a county to be able to address the problem of uh, radicalization and recruitment. But now the problem was, how do we implement this action plan? Is it just an Nairobi level plan? Can we, are we just be, will, will we just be talking to ourselves uh, in these big hotels and cities? What can we do so that we can reach uh, the difficult or the, the hard uh, to reach communities? And so it became apparent that yes, we may need to start uh, involving uh, the cities, as Eric said, or for our case, uh, the counties, uh, in terms of discussing peace and security. Uh, secondly, uh, the national strategies uh, and uh, whatever we are, we are using, the tools that we are using to address uh, this problem. And I think, as uh, Anwar uh, said during the, uh, the, the first week, uh, you know, they, they, are, they are not in sync with the local realities and nuances. And again, like in, in Kenya, Kenya is a vast country although it's not vast as many of our countries in Africa, but uh, there are those differences in terms of the grievances that may drive people to radicalization uh, from the coastal part of the country uh, to the cities and to the areas, for example, uh, neighboring uh, Somalia. So now this national strategy was not able to really uh, capture or address uh, those uh, local nuances uh, in terms of uh, what is causing uh, this problem. And that's why, for example, we thought that uh, a, a plan uh, for a county like Kuala in the coast could be different uh, from a plan like Nairobi in the capital, and maybe a plan like uh, Garissa uh, to, 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 to the areas uh, bordering uh, Somalia. Again, we, as a county, we have come to realize that uh, sometimes we have this, uh, a disconnect uh, between national level policies and what is happening in the ground. And I can give you an example. Uh, in 2015, uh, our government uh, issued an amnesty uh, for returning uh, foreign fighters uh, in Kenya, we are calling them Britanni. Those who are coming back from Somalia. So they were given actually an amnesty to surrender and to be rehabilitated uh, by the government. But uh, what came out is that uh, there was no clear, uh, like uh, what was communicated at the national level and what was being undertaken uh, in the countries. There was a lot of discrepancy. Uh, for example, there's a case, uh, somebody showed up in a police station in Mombasa and said, yes, I have heard that there's an amnesty uh, for returning foreign fighters. Actually, I'm one of them and really like to take uh, this offer. Uh, then the police officer who was actually manning the counter could not know what to do with this guy. This guy is not a criminal, so I cannot lock him up. So what do I do with this guy? So he tried uh, to call uh, his commander, the station commander. And the commander said, you know, I don't know how to deal with that guy. Probably called uh, Human Rights Agenda. Human Rights Agenda is a human rights organization. Maybe they'll know what to do with it. So just from that experience, you can realize that uh, there's a disconnect uh, between what is happening at the national level and what is happening uh, in the countries. And that's why there was a need uh, to have uh, this uh, strategy. Uh, again, radicalization, again, is very uh, local. As we said, uh, most of the grievances around exclusion, uh, around uh, uh, maybe marginalization, uh, are very local in as much as uh, the ideology could be global. But uh, those, most of the grievances are very local. And that's why we thought that uh, we need some local action plan that speaks to the local realities and that can be able to highlight uh, local priorities that can be, can be understood. And also for us, uh, what also made us, uh, it is easy for us to have this local action plan. Already we had existing national uh, like policies. Uh, we had the national strategy to counter extremism. So it was easy for us uh, to come up with a national plan as one way of cascading uh, this uh, strategy so that it can be implemented uh, in, the, in the counties. But uh, one thing that is not uh, said or, or has not been written about the Kenyan experience is, and that's and also maybe just uh, coming back to what you said earlier, Idris, uh, during the first week, is that uh, unlike um, probably many other counties, in Kenya, one of our counties uh, called Kuala was actually the first to develop a county strategy 
to cut violent extremism even before the national government had developed their strategy. But uh, the government has said there's no way a subnational unit can come up with a security strategy before we launch ours. So now uh, we, uh, the national government was given more time to finalize the national strategy. But in actual sense, a county had uh, started to do their own strategy based on their own need. And for Kuala, uh, this is a county uh, whereby we have had a long history of uh, returnees. Most of the returnees coming from Somalia were actually going back to that county, meaning that most of them were the one recruited and go to Somalia. We have also had a problem of uh, extrajudicial killings and uh, disappearances of those who have come back to uh, Kenya and it's suspected that maybe they are being targeted by the law enforcement agencies. Uh, maybe they're also targeted by Al-Shabaab sympathizers who are in the communities because when they come back, they may uh, leak uh, their strategies and their secrets. And even the communities were not able, were not ready to impress them because they could be easily profiled. So in this particular county, there was that actually need uh, to have a plan or a way of doing it. But again, because um, there was a lot of uh, suspicion, Eric talked about uh, trust issues. So how can we work with returnees, for example? It was very difficult. And that's why we say we need the national government. We need the security. And that's how now the idea of coming up with a, a local a CV action plan uh, came in. Uh, but now, later the government took over and uh, we had the national uh, strategy. And after that, now uh, we had uh, other counties uh, coming up uh, with their um, uh, county uh, action plan. So I, I can say partly, yes, there was a need, locally driven. But again, as uh, we'll discuss later, um, um, in other counties, uh, maybe uh, it was a directive that they need to have the county plans uh, because in other areas, it was a success. But uh, in terms of the need, that's how we were able to establish a need for these actual plans in Kenya. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. It's a very important, important, um, you know, ideas that came out and message quite clear. Mm, you know, you've, uh, you've highlighted, uh, you know, the well, the understanding and the necessity to the, when developing uh, national strategies to realize that national uh, local action plans could be different from one region to another within one country you will have different contexts and then different uh, i would say uh, nuances that one has to cater for and and and, and make sure to reflect the local uh, cve plans of action this is why you know uh, this is one of the uh, most important points uh, in of of developing the local CVE action plans, but not only the document, you want to ensure that you have full ownership also of the implementation process. And that's quite important uh, to, 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 to us. So Eric, let me come back to you. Um, uh, although contexts differ across countries and even within countries, as, 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 as we heard, can you share with uh, the participants some common guiding principles for the drafting and designing of local action plans? And I think you made reference to the GCTF uh, you know, best practices, uh, which are part, I think we, we are included in the uh, in the reading material, but it would be great to hear from you what could be uh, some of the guiding principles uh, in, in relation to drafting and designing local CVE plans of action. Sure. You... Uh, I think the, the first uh, principle should be making sure um, a dedicated local action plan is needed to deal with extremism violent extremism threats at the, at the local level. Uh, and I say that because um, in many respects, a lot of these, a lot of communities are facing many more pressing uh, challenges than violent extremism and are uh, resource constrained. Uh, and so um, in many respects, they may have existing uh, local plans for dealing with some broader set of issues into which one could uh, integrate violent extremism issues. So I think the first question has to be, um, is the threat level sufficient enough at a local level to justify the resources and human and otherwise to devote to a dedicated plan uh, at a local level to prevent and counter violent extremism? And that gets to the second uh, sort of a, a second guiding principle, which is that all of this has to be informed by a risk assessment and a needs assessment, uh, both the threat and the capacities. Um, and uh, it has to be whole of city or 
whole of community so that you you have all the right players at the table from the beginning, uh, ideally. Um, and that includes on the law enforcement and the non-law enforcement side, um, recognizing that what I've just said is very difficult to achieve uh, in the beginning. Um, and I think the, the w one lesson learned is that where there are trust issues that in, in part you start small and you start building it out over time uh, to get the kind of uh, robust uh, multi-stakeholder commitment that will, you will eventually need. But if you start with that requirement at the beginning, it can be challenging. Um, if you do mo move forward with a plan, it has to be data informed and evidence-based what the threats are, what the priorities are, what the kinds of interventions should be that the plan brings together. Um, in, 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 in some cases, cities don't have access uh, to the kinds of information about the threat that um, is critical for them to understanding it at their community level and that the um, information about the threat is, uh, for lack of a better word, monopolized and controlled by the national security apparatus and who, who don't fully trust or don't fully th don't think that cities have a role to play so that they don't see the need to share. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, one good practice is um, uh, although it's, it's rarely followed, is to have in cities, in regions of a country where there is a violent extremist threat, to have a representative from the national security um, apparatus embedded in, at the city level, whether physically or virtually, so that there is this constant communication, sharing of, of information about the threat in a two-way manner with the um, uh, central government. Um, it, another key principle is the need for it to be community-led. I think the example I shared with you about in Kumanovo, North Macedonia, um, there were some questions about the extent to which this was being led by the community as opposed to driven quietly by the Ministry of Interior. Um, I think that uh, when you're talking about the role of a city, it's primarily in prevention, in uh, in sort of more community focused interactions uh, as opposed to individual interventions with those who are at risk of radicalization or um, at, um, have already radicalized and are returning from the conflict zone or something. So it's really in the early prevention space that um, cities have the comparative advantage as they can tap into resources or uh, programs they have on housing, education, um, uh, sports culture um, that can be leveraged uh, to deal with issues around violent extremism. And then sustainability is another issue and ensuring that um, there are, are resources, uh, there's the necessary human resources, uh, which are often already stretched at a city level, um, even before you start thinking about a local action plan uh, for, for for preventing and countering violent extremism. How is the city or the municipality that's gonna coordinate this plan going to uh, do that over sustained period? Are they gonna get the resources from the central government? Are they gonna generate it through their own tax tax revenue, which most cities don't, in, in many parts of the world, don't, don't have control over? Um, or that is it gonna be donor funded? And all of these issues come into play, which um, again, really argue in my mind that leaving the Kenya example as a sort of an, I think as an outlier, um, that the most efficient and effective way to do this is not through a dedicated uh, PCVE plan, but integrating this issue into existing, uh, whether it's broader issues or other uh, crime issues, safeguarding, resilience, um, uh, things that the city might already be working on. And I think one thing we didn't, talk about today yet, but perhaps came up earlier in the course is the PCVE is still a potentially stigmatizing uh, term. Um, no one wants to be seen as a community that needs uh, PCV interventions or a PCV plan, because that means there's a violent extremism threat in the community. And it's often emerging from the community, although 
you could you could debate whether it's being exported into the community or emerging uh, and um, organically from the community. But I think sensitivity around the framing is also a critical uh, principle here. So if you are going to talk about these issues, making sure you're using terminology um, that is um, uh, not alienating to the community that you need you need to bring on board, and that there's a shared understanding uh, between and among the different actors, including the police and uh, the non-law enforcement stakeholders about terminology. You don't want different parts of a city network or a city team that's putting together this program, this plan to be using different terminology um, uh, when they're talking about the same types of issues. So that would be um, uh, another principle. And I think the final principle, again, gets back to the issue of national local cooperation. Not only does there have to be some level of cooperation between the national and local stakeholders before you start thinking about a, a local action plan, um, and, but there has to be built into the plan some sort of ongoing consultation process where uh, national stakeholders and local stakeholders are in, in, in dialogue. Um, and again, there, I can't think of very many examples uh, outside of Kenya, to be honest, where um, the, this 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 works, even in whether it's in, in in Western Europe, for example, there are plenty of local plans uh, that 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 exist, um, but there's rarely the connect the connectivity between uh, the local action plan sort of environment and the national uh, central government level. There are few exceptions, um, but again, and I'll just close with this is that in so many respects, the ability of a country to see uh, sorry, local action plans take root is driven by or determined by um, how the country is organized in terms of governance and how decentralized or centralized the governance system is. And um, it's very difficult to see local action plans take root in a country that's very centralized. Uh, and, and France is a great example um, where it's a very centralized system. Everything runs out of Paris. And um, rather than encouraging local plans to emerge bottom up, they basically impose variations of their national framework on different regions of, of France um, with not a lot of consultation with the local community. And then you have cities doing their own thing um, often trying to make up for what the, the central government's not doing, but it's not done with any kind of um, strategic uh, planning or thinking. It's sort of very ad hoc as a result. So um, I would just, uh, these issues are, are, are prevalent everywhere. I would just close actually with one very interesting uh, anecdote or, st or story. Um, the city of Christchurch, New Zealand, um, which as we know was um, the, victim of a, of a horrific attack uh, a few years ago, um, terrorist attack a few years ago. In the aftermath of that attack, um, as uh, the central government was studying what happened and trying to understand how to make prevent it from happening again, and, um, and then they, the, the, the prime minister and the, uh, joined together with other leaders to issue the Christchurch call to action. Um, the city of Christchurch, was never consulted on this, this because the central government did not think that the city of Christchurch or any city in New Zealand has any role to play whatsoever in dealing with issues of violent extremism. And um, the role of the city is to deal with the garbage, to deal with traffic, to deal with very sort of um, uh, technical mundane kinds of things, but not security. And um, the city of Christchurch, needless to say, felt completely alienated. And you know they know their community better than the central government. They know what's going on in terms of uh, uh, these kinds of threats within their community more than the central government. And if the central government really wants to get a handle on this threat in their country, the city governments can't be an afterthought. They have to be part of the solution. And I think this is starting to change.
in 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 Christchurch, but it took a horrific sorry in in New Zealand, but it took a horrific attack to get the conversation moving in the right direction. So I think um, again, these are problems that every country around the world has in some level is grappling with. Uh, and again, Kenya is, I think, a shining example of what, of, of, uh, of what can be done if, if there's the right kind of um, uh, conditions. But as Dominic shared, there's still some challenges that, that, that uh, are being faced in Kenya. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, uh, you've highlighted very important uh, principles such as the uh, risk assessment, threat assessment, and then maybe a stakeholder mapping, uh, which is national and maybe local to ensure, as you said, rightly indicated that uh, you have the right players around the table, but also to ensure that uh, you're adopting a whole of society, a whole of community approach. Uh, the, um, also, I like the idea about when there are trust issues to start small, uh, to build that trust between the communities and local enforcement agencies, in particular security and defense forces, you know, and then develop that relationship like every other relationship, uh, you know, um, once you progress and see a, an added value to it, then you uh, um, you develop that trust and know that you can count on the, uh, you know, the partner that you have within that um, endeavor. Um, I think the um, sustainability is a serious issue that also that is coming back in terms of uh, usually when we talk about sustainability, we have a tendency of thinking about financial, but I think you put the, uh, you know, another uh, problem, problem that we have is the human resource uh, capacity uh, in order to not only develop, uh, oversee and implement, uh, but to ensure that the cities are not outstretched more than they are. Uh, another idea which is coming out and, and a good principle is uh, uh, these are two linked principles, I would say one, which is the terminology that we use. And the other one is to ensure that whatever uh, actions that we're undertaking, uh, we can you know, undertake it without necessarily putting a label on it, a uh, specific label on CVE or terrorism, uh, but make it part and parcel of a project that is existing at the level of uh, you know, the, uh, the, the location or the locality. Uh, but also within the mandate of the different stakeholders uh, without necessarily, again, putting a label on it as VE or, uh, or counterterrorism, in a way not to alienate uh, communities, but also alarm them and, and put them on heightened alert. Um, the issue of national and local cooperation, this consultation process, I think, uh, indeed, as you indicated, and it's a good practice, is to ensure that they are embarked and consulted from the conceptualization all the way through uh, you know, the design uh, of both the strategy and the plan of action. Uh, this also uh, allows you to build that trust and ensure that you have some kind of communication channels that, are, that enable the different stakeholders to exchange with each other, but also to, uh, to, to, um, to provide guidance uh, where uh, necessary. And um, indeed, the governance system, uh, and it's something that we don't think about much uh, because we're still in that mindset of, copy and paste and they just have something that is worth presenting, but the governance system does indeed impact whether we are able uh, to implement a, a, a local CVE action plan or not. Uh, is it dictated from the central government and cascaded down or is it a bottom up uh, approach? Uh, so the governance system and understanding that system is quite useful and important for us that are trying to assist member states in developing the national uh, strategies and plans of actions. So Dominique, Again, uh, given your experience in policy development, can you share with participants the drafting and consultation process for the development of an inclusive and citizen-centered local CVE plan of action? Uh, thank you. And uh, just again to warn the participant that uh, the Kenyan experience I'm going to share is not like really the best or not the template, but basic, basically you can draw some inspiration on that process uh, to come up with a very uh, comprehensive uh, action plans. And I just want to say that uh, maybe just uh, to give us a, a, a background that in Kenya, we have what are calling it a three generations of local action plan. And uh, uh, the first and the second generation were the first one to be developed. Uh, they were developed in the areas that had uh, suffered this problem of extremism. Uh, that is basically the coastal area and uh, parts of the areas are neighboring Somalia. So they are really uh, suffered. And to them, it was a need. It was easy to I see the need. 
And uh, the process of uh, uh, designing uh, this actual plan were very consultative uh, and uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, meetings were held with the communities and the government agencies. Uh, then we had uh, what we are calling it the third generation uh, uh, local plans. Uh, for us, we are calling it a rapid action plans. Uh, we are calling it rapid because uh, they were developed rapidly, uh, whereby there was a presidential directive that uh, based on the success of the local action plan in the coast and in the Northeast, and uh, also because of the changing uh, profile of extremism or terrorists, especially after the uh, attack in Nairobi or the 14 uh, Riverside Drive attack. Uh, you know, for a long time in Kenya, when you talk about extremism, you talk about Al-Shabaab or even Al-Qaeda, what comes to mind are Somalis or Kenyan Somalis and our citizens from the coastal region who have some uh, Arabic kind of uh, ancestry. So that's, that's the, the, the first profile that comes in. But uh, when we had the attack uh, in Dusit, actually the mastermind or the attackers were not the normal Somalis, for example, or the Arabs uh, in Kenya. But these are now the normal Kenyans, uh, the Kenyans who are coming from other parts of the country that has not, that has not had any history of extremism. So now that actually I joined it, uh, the national debate to say that uh, now, uh, this problem is not just uh, part of the uh, Muslim dominated areas, but it's a national problem. And that based on that, uh, the president gave a directive that uh, every remaining county should develop their, their plans. They were developed rapidly. Uh, there were like uh, one or two days consultations uh, in the capital of each of the county, uh, whereby some few stakeholders were mobilized and they came up with a plan. Again, uh, this, uh, this could be what you said earlier. Uh, there were some uh, few cases of uh, cut and paste between the counties because the process was being rushed. And uh, we were using basically like one organization, one consultant that was supporting us uh, to come with that, that process. Uh, so, but for this one, I think I'll use uh, the first generation experience, especially the one that we had uh, in Wale. Uh, uh, that was the first cup that we had in the country. So I think that the first thing, and as, as we said earlier, is that uh, you, you really need to establish a need. We really need to, uh, to convince the community that yes, uh, this is something that we need to address. You really need to uh, convince the government that yes, uh, security CV is your mandate, but uh, we, we still believe that the community, uh, the national, the county government has a big role to play. So we have to even uh, convince the national government that uh, peace and security, including CV, is a shared responsibility. So we really need to, to establish that need. And uh, also building up on just what Eric said uh, for the communities. Uh, we also need uh, to uh, 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 assure them that we are not profiling them. When you, when you come to your county, we are not saying that you guys are the one harboring extremists or uh, terrorists. Uh, it's just a need that we need to address. So again, the issue of the framing uh, was very, uh, very important. So uh, what we did in Kuala, uh, we had uh, a CV colloquium, a county CV conference, so to speak, uh, whereby all the stakeholders in the county were invited uh, elected leaders, uh, national government uh, leaders, uh, community uh, uh, leaders, and now there was a discussion that yes, we are having this problem. We have the national strategies, we have the police, we have the military, but still we are not able to address this problem. What will be the missing link? And uh, it was agreed that yes, probably we need the input of the communities and their local leaders and, and their local government. And uh, based on that uh, colloquium, there was an agreement that yes, we need to develop a local action plan that speaks to our local needs and can be able to highlight our local priorities. And that was the, uh, the first uh, breakthrough uh, to get the buy-in of the government as well as the community. And uh, we, were all, we were also able to use our research or data to actually demonstrate to the communities that uh, this is a problem. And uh, there was a research that was done some times back uh, in, in, in coastal region of Kenya. A coastal region of Kenya, uh, 50 percent of their economy depends on tourism. But uh, when we had this problem uh, escalating from 2012, 2014, uh, the Western government uh, started issuing travel advisories, so there were no tourists coming. So that research demonstrated that uh, the, actually the economy of the region was now operating at half of that 50 percent. So actually already the, the region was lagging behind the, the other regions in the country because of this extremism. And yes, now the communities were able to understand that, yes, uh, this is a problem. Initially, again, uh, in Kenya, there was this perception that uh, 
terror extremism is just a problem of uh, Christians because Al Shabaab are targeting Christians. So if you're coming from a Muslim area, why do you care? Uh, why do we have the actual plan? But uh, later, uh, these extremists, they started targeting teachers, targeting health workers, and even construction workers in those areas, in the, the very Muslim dominated areas. And we saw an exodus of teachers and health and other personnel from those areas. So now the local community, uh, by default, realize that now you must do something. Because now you are a parent, you are having a child who is in secondary school, your child wants to study physics, but uh, the only physics teacher was uh, a local, than Muslim, and that teacher has gone. So now, uh, because of those kind of research, because of those kind of experiences, uh, the community realized that yes, this is a priority, and that uh, we have a role uh, to play, and it was that uh, buy-in uh, in terms of uh, extremism. Uh, also, uh, we also ensure that we, we made a reference uh, to international and national strategies uh, to, again, to convince people that uh, this is not just an isolated problem. This is actually a global problem that we need to, to join the global um, uh, initiative, uh, starting from our local level, uh, to start uh, undermining uh, some of these narratives by some of these uh, global groups like Al Qaeda and, uh, and ISIS. And also, again, assuring people that, uh, yes, we are not just uh, um, we're we 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 not just uh, doing like a, to try, trying to experiment with your security or your life. We are actually dealing with a, uh, an issue that will address uh, your problem. Uh, so, uh, uh, based on that, where now there's that buy in from the community, uh, the local leaders, and the government, uh, then the next step was now to establish a small committee to spearhead the process. So, there's an interim committee, again, uh, composed of uh, local leaders, uh, civil society. Uh, national government and county government. So this committee now was charged uh, in terms of overseeing uh, the process of developing uh, the actual plan. And um, uh, what also we have, we, we did, uh, we ensured that, um, that this committee uh, actually represented the face of the local communities. Because by that time, in 2014, for example, it was very difficult to discuss extremism or terrorism. It was very difficult uh, because as Eric said, it was something profiling. So nobody was really to talk about it. And actually for us, our entry point was peace and security. We, are, we were not mentioning uh, extremism <laughs> at, at that time. We're just saying that we really need to do something about peace and security. And of course now as the discussion progresses, now people open up and they can now even mention al Shabab. So that's how we were able to break uh, the ice. Uh, so uh, after that, uh, the committee or that interim committee uh, commissioned uh, a fact-finding mission or a research or an assessment again, to go through the county to try now to understand uh, this problem, uh, to understand uh, maybe if there are any gaps, and, and most importantly, uh, to come up uh, with the uh, local priorities that will, will be part of the action plan. Uh, one, of the, one of the things that really made us uh, to progress is that uh, in the first uh, research, we used local professors. Uh, so now when you go to a community, uh, they see Professor Idris, they know that this is our person. So even that rapport uh, was there. So for our case uh, in Kuala, uh, we used uh, uh, Professor Shauri Halimu and uh, we used uh, Professor uh, Hassan Mokimako. And so they were now the face of the actual plan. And so now when we went to the communities, there was less resistance because they see that if our professors, our own sons and daughters can say that uh, this thing is important, then definitely it is important. And that was a, a breakthrough. So from that a research uh, that looked at those various issues, uh, mapped the key actors, uh, looked at uh, the existing uh, strategies within the government, the existing laws, how can we leverage on existing uh, initiative? Uh, then uh, based on that, uh, we came up uh, with a, a draft uh, actual plan. So after the plan uh, was uh, 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 developed, then we went to another round of community consultations. Again, to make sure that uh, whatever has been captured in that uh, plan uh, reflects uh, the priorities of the community. So a number of uh, uh, consultations were held across the community, different community groups, including women and youth. And uh, basically to come up with a, a locally driven uh, uh, a solution. And then uh, we came with the second draft, uh, uh, which also I was able to spell out uh, the coordination uh, structures of the, of, of the plan, uh, the roles and responsibilities of the various organs, uh, including what we are calling the county engagement forum, where this is basically a forum of all the actors 
who are working on CV in that county uh, where they can be able to come up and um, uh, discuss their issues. Uh, we identify the priority areas where we are calling it our pillars uh, like education, uh, law enforcement, uh, internet or online. And uh, we were able to identify leaders of those pillars, both from the government and from the civil society. And uh, after that, now uh, we shared uh, this draft uh, with the National Counterterrorism Center, which is actually mandated by law uh, to lead this process. And uh, for them, they were able to review uh, the plan uh, make sure that uh, it actually uh, speaks to the national strategy. And uh, they also provided uh, their input on what can we do uh, to improve, to improve uh, this plan. And after that, uh, we had uh, validation, again, uh, bringing together uh, uh, key leaders uh, in the county uh, to come and uh, validate, agree, and actually own that, yes, these are documents, these are priorities. And, uh, and uh, for, again, for the national government through NCTC to confirm that uh, this plan is actually uh, building up to the national strategy. So uh, that was a, a, a very uh, important. Uh, then now, there's some of the steps that have not, then of course there was launch, uh, the, uh, the plans were launched, uh, there were local media, national media, basically to raise awareness uh, across the community so that uh, this plan is done and also to increase uh, community uh, ownership. Um, now, the process that uh, some of the counties are still ongoing uh, is on the legislation. You know you can have a plan, uh, but uh, without, without anchoring it on legislation or a policy framework, then it will become very difficult uh, for government uh, to implement, or even for us to hold the government accountable for implementing or not implementing uh, the plan. So uh, the next stage now is legislation uh, through our local assemblies. And this is the process that uh, is taking long than expected. Uh, because now, as, as I speak today, uh, it's only one county, that is our headquarters, Nairobi, that has uh, drafted a bill on uh, local action plan, which is now being subjected to what we are calling it public participation to become, before it becomes a county law. So that's now the area where we are. But again, uh, there are some resistance by the county assemblies uh, saying that, uh, no, this thing is a security issue, it's a national government issue. Why do we put in our resources on it? Why do we put on our money on it when we have the national government? So whenever, uh, resources are not enough, uh, the first thing or the first casualty in planning is this action plan because of that uh, perception that uh, these things should be done by the national government, not, not us. And, um, and uh, so that's actually the process uh, that we followed uh, to develop the plans. And uh, now the plans are being reviewed uh, from time to time, again, to respond to the realities. So that was the, the, the ideal situation that we followed for the first and second generation cups. But as I said earlier, for the uh, rapid cabs, uh, they were done rapidly. Uh, they were preventive in nature because they were in areas that have not experienced this problem. But we were just anticipating that uh, we may have this problem. What can we do uh, to make sure that uh, we, we address it? So they were done quickly, one or two days. And uh, we have those wraps. But again, probably we'll speak uh, next week. Uh, one, of, one of my colleagues uh, will talk about implementation. And these are some of the cabs that really faced the uh, uh, challenges in terms of implementation because the process was not consultative uh, like uh, uh, the other one. So I think in a, in, a, in, a, in a nutshell, I can say that's the process uh, that we followed in some counties in Kenya. But we still believe that uh, we will have that better to make it more uh, 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 collaborative and uh, more participatory in its development so that uh, it can be owned by the communities and the government. Thank you. Thank you, Dominique. Uh, it's, uh, it's quite, uh, you know, the Kenyan experience is quite uh, an experience and you're bringing many, um, I think many of the ideas we've been talking about since the you know last week into perspective and into the realities and i think you know you and and, and eric have echoed the importance of research and evidence based um, this process has to also be driven by you know analysis research and i like this idea of using local researchers they have much more i would say credibility within the localities within which uh, they're working you know cut and paste is not such a bad thing, you know, you need to start somewhere. And I think that's the echo you gave, you know, the, your, your comment from last week. I think you need to start somewhere. Um, you know, at least you have a good understanding of what is expected uh, in, to be seen in an action plan or a strategy. And then you tweak it, you adjust it according to the specific needs. And even the priorities, you might have national priorities, 
um, that you will see across the board. But the dosage, this is like, you know, a dose. You, you increase the dose here, you increase, you, you decrease it here according to the, uh, you know, the local context. And that's quite important. The continued consultation, uh, uh, you know, and we keep on repeating it. Eric repeated it, you know, from the conceptualization all the way through, you know, the, uh, the validation process. And I like this idea of back and forth between you and these local committees. Uh, of, of uh, drafting committee or, or how you call them, local community engagement uh, committee, uh, which is quite important. Not only are you picking their brains and, uh, you know, uh, taking notes of their priorities, but also once you send it back to HQ or I would say the central government or authority like the Kenyan case, the NCTC, uh, which uh, made sure that it was aligned with the national strategy, you came back again with the inputs of the national CTC. Um, you know, to present to this community and then to have a validation exercise along the way. This not only ensures, you know, trust building, tr uh, ensures local ownership, but it also ensures that these projects uh, or activities are thus implemented uh, by the uh, local actors. So I think this is quite useful. Uh, Eric, uh, one last question on your end. Uh, what are the lessons learned for effective designing and drafting of local CVE plans of actions? And I think you've you've already covered many of this uh, <laughs> this along the two uh, previous questions, but uh, please. yeah, th th thank you. And um, uh, I think it's important. Uh, one of the things that we haven't really touched upon is monitoring and evaluation and uh, impact uh, of these plans um, to ensure that as the threats changing, as the local context is changing, that the uh, the plan is adaptable and the uh, the stakeholders are, you have the right stakeholders around the table, um, uh, these, these community action teams or these local prevention networks are uh, able to address the needs and priorities uh, of the, the community. And um, so in, in Kumanovo, uh, North Macedonia, actually, um, the Strong Cities Network, which I run, we, we uh, commissioned an independent evaluation of the work we did there in developing, um, uh, supporting the development of community action team and a uh, local prevention, uh, local uh, action plan. And some of the findings were interesting, which I, which I thought I would share. Um, so I think this gets to some of the lessons learned. Um, on the positive, um, the finding was that uh, the community action team, which is the vehicle to implement the plan, uh, local plan, was embedded in the in the overall central government's national strategy, so that it was clearly a connection between the national framework and the local framework and the local implementation. The second p point was um, it, the community action team wasn't set up as sort of a new separate entity, but was established under the umbrella of the local prevention council. So an existing uh, um, framework that had uh, um, already had uh, community buy-in, uh, and this was key to seen as key to sustainability and harmonization in the community, um, and uh, sustaining in uh, local ownership. Uh, some some negative findings, and I think this gets to the lessons learned also, is that while it's easy to bring or relatively easy to bring people around the table, how do you keep them around the table for for sort of with this with the necessary levels of commitment over a long period of time? And I think one of the findings in Kumanova was that the, the levels of commitment among the different local stakeholders varied considerably over time. Um, and so that's uh, uh, particularly religious leaders, religious community representatives were, were under, um, uh, the finding was that they, were, they weren't fully bought in into the, uh, the process and the, uh, the, the way forward. Um, Decision-making process was seen as participatory and fair. So, of course, if you have a team put in place to oversee implementation of, of the local prevention, uh, local uh, action plan, decisions have to be made as to resources, as to prioritization, as to which interventions, what should the social workers be doing, what should the mental health professionals be doing. And that process has to be part, both participatory and fair. And it was, it was that, it was seen. But it, the other finding that I already shared with you was that there was a perception that the Ministry of Interior was, was driving, the driving the train and that 
because of concerns about over securitization and heavy handed law enforcement approach seeping into what's supposed to be a really a prevention resilience focused um, uh, non law enforcement driven plan um, that was seen as uh, uh, problematic. Um, and I think th those are some important recommend uh, uh, findings. And I think, um, uh, unfortunately, there, because there are very few plans, local plans, there are even, and there are rarely evaluations of, of these plans. Um, I, th I'm, I believe Kumanovo's independent evaluation is one of the few. It's being, it'll be made public very soon. It's being published. But I think sharing lessons learned across cities and across municipalities and these issues is so important. And um, the, the Strong Cities Network, which I run, is really growing its, its, its footprint in Africa, is really looking to work with more and more African cities on helping them uh, take the steps forward uh, uh, along the lines that uh, Kenya has done and in some other parts of the world um, to, for them to understand uh, what, what their roles are here, what their comparative advantages here, why cities matter in this area is critical. It's critical to uh, shifting the discourse away from an over-securitized, um, heavy, heavy handed central government dominated approach to addressing a threat that clearly has had its limitations over the past 20 years to much more of a locally driven, locally owned one that focuses more on prevention and re building resilience. And cities have to be at the center of that. And, um, uh, but that's not gonna happen um, magically. Um, Central governments have to recognize that there, there needs to be space for cities and cities have to re recognize that they need to step up and um, depending on the local context, depending on the threats, depending on the resources, they need to play a role. Uh, um, and uh, we're looking forward to working with you, Idris, and many of, many of those that are on this, uh, on this call, uh, Zoom right now uh, over the next few years to uh, grow the capacity of uh, cities across the continent in this area. Thank you, thank you, Eric. Uh, we're, we're also looking forward to that. And I think this is a, quite an exciting uh, uh, program and project that we're embarking on uh, because it will allow us, um, you know, indeed, like you said, this uh, sharing of experience between cities and, 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 and uh, uh, I would say in the development of local CVE plans of actions, but also it can give uh, the necessary argument to many of our participants to, to bring to their decision makers uh, at their level in order to ensure that this process is indeed driven bottom uh, up and at uh, top bottom with the, you know, the added value and comparative advantage that you and Dominique have, uh, have, have shown us today. Dominique, let me come back to you with our last question today. Um, given your experience in monitoring and evaluating the impact of uh, CVE programs, uh, can you share with the participants uh, some of the key lessons learned for effective design, development, and implementation of local CVE plans of actions? Over to you. Uh, thank you, Idris. Um, some of the challenges that we faced while developing uh, these uh, local action plan. Uh, one number one is actually uh, trying to convince uh, the communities that uh, this is an, a priority issue in their communities. Uh, you know, sometimes I, I think uh, extremism is like a COVID pandemic. Uh, in Kenya now, if you say that you do a national survey, or even in the countries, you do a survey of the top security issues, I can assure you in most of the counties, extremism will not feature anywhere uh, in top five. Uh, people will have so many problems, uh, cattle rustling, banditry, uh, guns. So there are many issues that people experience on a day-to-day basis. So for them, they'll not really understand that this is a major issue. And I say it's like a COVID because uh, there may be very few attacks but uh, those attacks can actually affect economies, national economies. For example, I gave the example of the coastal region. Because of those uh, attacks, uh, advisories were issued and uh, the, almost the whole economy collapsed. The whole, almost the education uh, sector in the northern part of the country is uh, in dire straits because of some of these things. So I think um, we were not able uh, to really uh, persuade the communities that yes, this thing may not be a number one priority in your community, but in terms of the, its effect, there's no any conflict 
that's had devastating effects on your economy, on your relations, even on your movement than radicalization and extremism. So I think uh, that was uh, the, the, the first challenge we faced uh, to convince uh, the communities that uh, this is uh, a priority issues for you uh, to put your resources, especially the county government uh, and, and, other, and other leaders. So we could have done better in terms of those research and um, again, uh, convincing people that it's, it's an, uh, uh, an important thing. Uh, closely related to that uh, is uh, there was an inadequate awareness of some of these caps. So most of them, local plans, were just known uh, within the major towns, uh, the major urban centers, uh, maybe within the government, within society. But when you go to the communities, uh, particularly youth and others, uh, they don't know what is an action plan we're talking about. So the awareness was limited. So if, if we did a, a, a quick assessment of some of these uh, caps, and even within the government, uh, you're actually supposed to be a member of uh, this county action plan, uh, but because you have been newly posted in that uh, locality, nobody uh, inducted you on that. So you just told, you are just told, go to this meeting. Today, there's a meeting of a local action plan. Can you go and represent the government? But when, when you go there, you don't know what's happening. There's nothing you can say. So there was a problem with the, uh, raising awareness on this plan and uh, what needs to be done uh, for us uh, to be able to, to look at it. Uh, we still, uh, we're still having uh, problems or challenges with the coordination uh, between the national government and the county government and the civil society or the other stakeholders. We still believe that there's some level of tension, especially between the law enforcement agencies and some elements of uh, the civilian uh, part of the government and uh, CSOs. So again, uh, there's still some tensions and especially because uh, most of the uh, civil society, they speak this language of accountability, they speak this language of uh, human rights, which does not uh, resonate very well. Unfortunately, with some of our law enforcers and some of our military personnel, uh, we think that uh, we are actually um, uh, frustrating uh, their work. Uh, uh, they are supposed to, uh, to, uh, to arrest and uh, probably kill uh, those terrorists. But uh, now when we talk about those things, then that affects our coordination uh, in that. Um, uh, for example, uh, we projected or we packaged our local action plans as a shared responsibility within the national government and the county government. At the county level, uh, we have the county commissioner who represented the president. And then on the other side, we have a governor who has been elected by the people. So there was, the two of them were supposed to co-chair uh, this actual plan. But uh, with the time, we realized that the national government uh, was left to deal with the actual, uh, the actual plan uh, as the county government uh, thought that maybe it's not their priority. Security is not their, their major issue. And uh, probably they were expecting some funding, which was not forthcoming. So they lost interest in the whole process. Uh, again, leaving the national government uh, to continue with it because it's their, their mandate. Um, again, and I think Eric talked about it, about uh, monitoring and evaluation and, and reporting. There were no clear mechanism on how can we monitor, how can we evaluate uh, the progress of these caps. Uh, uh, we have a report. So if you go to a certain county, you want some data on maybe how many meetings have you had, how many young people have you reached, you cannot get that data. So we had a challenge with that. But as I speak, uh, our NCTC has actually come up uh, with, uh, with an online MRD system whereby somebody can just uh, log in, uh, key in data, and they're able to see it uh, in Nairobi or in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the headquarters. Uh, then again, the major thing now is basically resourcing. Resourcing, this is now the major bottleneck. And I think as I said, we, we, we were not able to manage our expectations when we were developing these things. So these things uh, were developed when we had the first county government. And at that time, it looked like there was a lot of money within the counties. So we in the civil society, we thought that finally, we can now access this money that is within the county government to implement uh, peace issues, including a CVE. The same with the national government. We thought that in addition to what they have, they will also now uh, dip into this uh, basket. On the other hand, the county government, they thought that yes, security is not our mandate, but now that we have been brought into this thing uh, through the local action plan, probably it can allow us now to uh, get some money from the government, get some allocation uh, to work on security. So when they realized that money was not forthcoming, then that interest uh, uh, went there. They also thought that uh, there's this perception that uh, NGOs or donors have a lot of money. So by coming through the cup, 
then we can access uh, their, their funding. So nobody uh, was able to, to understand how can we fund uh, this, uh, uh, this cap. And uh, based on that, so now if you do any assessment, the first complaint we'll be told is this lack of resources. We expect the national government, we expect the county government to put money, or nobody has, has put money. But uh, what we are now doing, we are reconceptualizing the funding and implementation of the cap. So we are saying that as long as this cap can identify the priorities that this will be under, to be undertaken in, in a given locality, that's, that's it. You can come as a national government with their funding, you can come as a county government with their own allocation, you can come with us as a CSO with our own money, so long as we are addressing the priorities that has been highlighted uh, by the cap. That's what, what now we are now trying to uh, recall, uh, conceptualize. How do we resource and how do we implement some of these things? And uh, again, as I think, uh, as uh, Eric said earlier, uh, the, the whole problem of framing. Uh, again, uh, the communities that we had, the first caps, uh, felt that we targeted them, we profiled them, and we exposed them to attacks and raids by security officers. So that was an unforeseen uh, kind of a, a challenge that, that we faced uh, from those uh, uh, communities. And um, in terms of some of the lessons that we have learned uh, while developing and while implementing uh, some of this plan is that violent extremism as well as CV is very dynamic. It changes very fast. Our first uh, caps were five years in terms of a, a period. But we re realized that in five years, so many things can change. Uh, you know, as I, as I said earlier, initially, we thought that it's a problem that is only affecting the non-Muslims. And uh, this is a, a problem that probably is only limited to Muslim dominated areas. But with time, we realized that uh, those who are being recruited, uh, the areas being attacked are, not, are, are, are changing. So we really need to be very uh, dynamic uh, when we are developing some of these things. And I saw in the chat, somebody said that we really need to be uh, reviewing uh, these plans uh, annually. And I think that's, that's now what we are doing in Kenya. In Kenya, we are doing what we are calling remodeling. Again, coming up with annual work plans that we can easily be uh, uh, monitored and, and, and reviewed, and we can adjust uh, to changing uh, uh, our situation. Uh, as I said earlier, again, use of local expertise and researchers uh, really increase the uptake and ownership of the CAPS. And like, for example, in other countries whereby we use the experts from other areas. So uh, uh, in terms of um, how they were, uh, in terms of how they were um, received in those areas, I uh, was different from where uh, local personnel or local researchers uh, were, in, uh, were there. And then uh, also when you're working with some of these things to address uh, the challenge of resources, try as much as possible to work with existing resources. Look at your resources within the government, within the non-government stakeholders. What do we have? How can we leverage on those resources that are just coming up with a shopping list, so to speak? Uh, then otherwise we'll be uh, very uh, 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 disadvantaged. And again, uh, building up what you, in the first week, uh, it is what you said. I think it's also very important to demonstrate uh, to the communities and to the government uh, that actually we are not imposing a Western plan or a Western strategy on you. Uh, initially, there was some resistance that you guys, uh, you know, you are funded by Americans. So you are just um, imposing American plans and strategies on us. And so we really need to tell them that, uh, no, uh, this thing uh, affects us uh, in so many uh, ways. And uh, again, something that I uh, was mentioned during the first uh, week, the first uh, seminar, is that uh, these are uh, our plans were very successful in areas or in communities that they have had a history of peace building where they have been having civil society organization, where they have been donors, so, so to speak. But in other areas where we don't have donors, uh, we don't have a civil society, again, uh, uh, the process was very difficult and even the uptake uh, was not good. So it was able to ride on existing uh, 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 work that has been done by, by, by others. But uh, also what we have learned and I think uh, maybe uh, my parting shot uh, to the rest of the esteemed participants, don't be afraid to make a mistake or don't be afraid to fail. Uh, so long as you can generate lessons that can help you in uh, probably coming up with better plans uh, in future. I know, especially for civil society, because we report to donors, yeah, you, don't, you, you don't want to report some failures or some uh, difficulties. But uh, for us, we realize that uh, uh, failing, making mistakes is actually a lesson. Uh, that we can use uh, to improve our 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 well-being. 
And uh, also now what you are trying to do uh, to increase awareness is to translate some of those plans to some of the local languages. Uh, and also to maybe use things like uh, video graphics or small clips uh, uh, to be able to disseminate uh, uh, these are plans now, especially now to the, to, to the youth and others who can be able to access it uh, in social media and other online uh, uh, platform. Otherwise, uh, thank you so much. Oh, thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dominique. And thank you, Eric. This is a, a wealth of information. I'm sure, you know, I myself have been in this business for quite some time and it will take me, you know, quite an afternoon to digest everything you told us today. It's, uh, I, I have to thank you very much because you're bringing the subject to, to reality. I'm, I'm not going to attempt to summarize what you said, but I think there are a few points that I want us to, uh, to highlight on. Again, it's the necessity to do a threat assessment. So the threat assessment, risk assessment will dictate, you know, whether you need to have a plan of action, a specific CVE or uh, PCVE plan of action in place. Uh, there is also a need as, uh, as we heard for a, a stakeholder uh, mapping, uh, but also this idea of training uh, the stakeholders or the actors is quite important. And then um, the issue of uh, trust building that has to be taken care of and really uh, taken into account when we're developing or trying to involve uh, local uh, community or local actors and start small, think big, and also develop this relationship, involve the stakeholders from the conceptualization all the way through, uh, you know, the process of, of drafting, uh, and, and reviewing the uh, strategy, but also the plan of action. It has to be driven from the bottom to the top, uh, but also you need to have some feedback from the top to ensure that the plans of actions are aligned with national strategies um, to take into account that we are living in a very changing environment and today's problems and priorities might not be the same problems and priorities at the end. But I think Dominique has told us that, yes, you might make mistakes even in identifying the priorities or setting priorities or identifying the problems. So you need to embed a process of reviewing, uh, going back to uh, you know, the, the plan itself, adjusting it and recalibrating it to uh, you know, the uh, local conditions and context. So monitoring evaluation, continuous review. So we need to embed the process of continuous development and no bad lesson is, uh, I, I would say a disaster. It's a good lesson. I come from, uh, you know, from the private sector and we usually say there is no bad experience. You learn something positive out of it. You learn that that's not the way you need to do it. You need to do it differently. So you need to continuously interrogate those plans, interrogate the added value of the, uh, the, the, the actors, but also the capacities of the actor to take lead on particular aspects of the plan is quite important. So these are some of the ideas at least you know, not trying to, uh, to summarize all the wealth of information that came from both speakers. Uh, I, I, will, I will, you know, on behalf of uh, all the participants, thank Eric and Dominic for taking, having taken the time today to share with us their insight, their experiences, 